Hey everyone, Kevin here with SwiftKick. Uh, so last week we tried to do the, a live episode of the SwiftKick show with my very good friend Matt Groves. But you know how technology can be sometimes. It, it works when you really don't need it to work and then it doesn't work when you absolutely need it to work. Well, it turns out about 20 minutes before the live episode of the SwiftKick show, Matt sends me a message saying, Hey, Kev, my internet has gone out completely. And we waited around for a few moments to see if it would just magically come back on. Turns out that didn't happen. So Matt, being a really good sport, gets in his car and drives to a Panera down the street and gets logged into the show and the Panera Wi-Fi at, it was probably right, right at lunchtime, was not really up to par for the the quality that we needed. It was really difficult for Matt to even hear us and it was hard for us to hear Matt. So we decided to go ahead and cut the show short and he went home and he recorded everything on his own machine, sent me a copy of it and that's what you're getting ready to watch now. So unlike a typical episode of the Swift Kick show where we have a little bit of an interview and then we get into the presentation, uh, this is just Matt doing his talk for us. No sequel shouldn't mean no security. Uh, again, thank you so much, Matt, for taking the time to record this. He didn't have to do that. Uh, he did it out of the goodness of his heart. And if you like what you see, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe because we do these episodes every two weeks and we love sharing it with you. Thanks so much. Have a great day, guys. Hi everybody, Matt Groves here. First I want to apologize to the SwiftKick fans for technical difficulties I had today. I was unable to get the live stream going. Internet access at my house uh, is, is down, it's still down as I'm recording this, and I was unable to get to a decent internet connection in time. So my apologies, but to make it up to you, I'm going to record this content as I would have presented it to you. Uh, the only difference is that you'll un be unable to ask questions live, but I'm always happy to answer questions and I'll give you all my contact information as we go. And I'm happy to share the slides with you as well. So what I wanted to talk about is, uh, well, this is the agenda. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what NoSQL actually is and why people use it. And then I'll dive into some of the security problems that we saw in the news in NoSQL, especially in 2017 uh, in 2016. And then I have a short demo that I did uh, around security and then I'll spend the rest of the session talking about well what can we actually do about it what can we do to improve the situation make it better and then at the end I'll summarize everything and I usually put the Q&A in there but like I said I don't really have that since this is not live my name is Matt Groves I'm a developer advocate for Couchbase which is uh, one of the leading NoSQL database companies you can contact me on Twitter at M. Groves I'm very active on there I also have my own podcast and blog and uh, I've had Kevin on the show actually um, to talk about uh, well, a couple episodes now, I believe. Uh, so check out his episodes on there. I'm not an expert in anything, especially when it comes to security. I'm, I'm a web developer. I'm not an info security expert. Uh, but I am enthusiastic about this kind of stuff, and I'm excited to see what Couchbase and others are doing to advance uh, security in, in the NoSQL database world. Okay, so NoSQL shouldn't mean no security. I think that's uh, a true statement. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it's always been that way, but let's talk about what NoSQL is first. So here's a brief history of NoSQL, and it's a little bit funny, a little silly uh, graphic here, but yeah, the invention of writing, that was really the first way to store data, and that did not use any sort of tables or relational uh, query languages or anything like that. So really, the NoSQL is older than SQL, if you want to be uh, silly about it, but uh, we go up to 1957 to 60, and we see IBM Sabre, which is the first commercial use of a computerized database, as we think of them now. And IBM Sabre was uh, designed uh, as a joint effort between uh, IBM and American Airlines as a better way to handle airline ticket bookings. It was not relational. It was more like a file system hierarchy, as we know today. So it's not even until 1970 that EFCOD proposes the relational database model, and that doesn't even include SQL. SQL is later invented by uh, Don Chamberlain and, and Boyce uh, later on um, in the 70s. In 79, the necessary sacrifices to the dark forces were made and the Oracle database was released. 
And uh, so we see Microsoft SQL Server coming along around 89. So around 1990, relational databases become the norm, in quotes. And so it's about 20 to 30 years uh, have passed since then to where we s just go to relational databases as the default to stick data in. We go to stick data in tables. Now all that stuff happened before the web was even invented in 91. And so as the web grows and grows in 2005, people start looking at old ideas because there's really nothing new underneath the sun. And there was a document database created called CouchDB, which was based on some of the ideas uh, that were in Lotus Notes. Very, very cool stuff in Lotus Notes in terms of data storage. I'm not a big fan of the email client, but uh, some of the underlying technology was very, very cool. So CouchDB took some of those ideas and ran with them and created uh, a JSON document database. 2006, 2007, we've got two uh, watershed papers in databases. So Google and Amazon, they're both huge companies struggling to keep their computers online because even you know a minute or two of downtime could mean a lot of ad revenue, a lot of sales that are not happening. So they worked on these projects, Big Table and Dynamo, as distributed uh, fault-tolerant databases, and they released white papers about them. And because of those white papers we see in 2008, 2009, uh, something like a Cambrian e explosion of NoSQL databases, especially open source ones, and we see React and Mongo, Cassandra and Redis, those are all influenced by those papers uh, coming out. Uh, and even DynamoDB, which was, it's roughly, you know, based on the Dynamo paper, but it's a public version of it. Uh, it was released by Amazon. 2010, the heavens open and Couchbase descends to the earth. And, uh, just another disclaimer that I do work for Couchbase. So, so that's the sort of the history of NoSQL. But NoSQL itself isn't a terribly useful term. So this is why I often say in my presentations, I often say that I have a NoSQL toaster. And I can operate this toaster completely without using any SQL queries, any tables, uh, anything like that. I can store data as bread. I can get it back out as toast. So Defining something by what it isn't is not terribly useful. Uh, it's, it's good marketing shorthand, I guess. So that's, that's kind of helpful for me to say, okay, it's databases that are different than the ones we've been doing for the last 30 years. But defining something by what it is not, it's only useful for a little while. So I usually like to go a little deeper and divide up the NoSQL landscape into uh, more specific types of databases. And what I'm going to focus on mostly today is, is document databases, but really all of these uh, have similar security issues um, in various uh, categories. So key value is the, is the simple, simplest version. You just have a key and you have some value, a unique key. Think of it like a giant dictionary and you can store whatever kind of data you want there. A document's a little bit more specialized because the data has a specific format like a JSON typically or sometimes XML or others. And so the, the a database can reason about the data, can index and things like that. And there's also wide column and graph, which are more specialized types of databases. Um, they also have their use cases. They're very cool things. But I like to focus on document database since Couchbase is a document database. And the NoSQL keyword kind of comes from this core set of operations. You have uh, get by key, set by key. And the same goes for key value as well. And you also have something maybe like a map reduce that can, again, reason about those documents and can do some pre-processing and, and run map uh, and reduce functions against it to do a kind of querying, but you're not writing SQL. So none of these things involve SQL, so that's kind of where the NoSQL buzzword comes from. Of course, things have changed a lot since those early days, but it's, it's still a buzzword that's stuck around. So why do people use NoSQL in the first place? Isn't relational good enough? Uh, why would I ever want to use something else? Well, there's several reasons. I'm just going to paint some broad strokes here. One is that these databases are designed to be scalable. Think back to the Amazon and Google routes and also the CouchDB distributed data routes with Lotus Notes. They're designed to uh, scale out. Uh, so you can just add more uh, servers, add more nodes to a cluster to handle more capacity as you grow. Uh, the other thing I think people like about NoSQL is that they are very easy to get started with. And, and what I mean by easy, and we're going to talk about this a lot today, is that you don't have to learn about normal form and tables, rows, columns, and all that kind of stuff. You just can start throwing JSON into it, um, which is you know something that a lot of front-end developers that are new to web development are already familiar with. So you can store data as JSON, and it makes things easier. And then fast. So a lot of them have architectures that are designed for speed. Again, 
for the low latency web or mobile uh, use case. That's a very important thing. Um, this is designed around sp specific access patterns, so it's not always faster, but for certain access patterns it is definitely going to be faster. So what I want to focus on today is the easy part of this, um, because that's gotten us in a bit of trouble, I think, in terms of security. So what makes these databases really easy? Uh, some of them are easier to scale horizontally than relational databases. You can certainly scale a horizontal or a relational database horizontally. It, it can be done, but it is difficult. They're not really designed for that. Uh, it's easy to throw data into them. Like I said, it can be JSON. They're great for new web developers. You don't have to learn a bunch of database theory. Uh, so that's the, those are two reasons. The third one is that it's easy to install a lot of these and just start storing data. Uh, so you can often get installed in uh, just a few seconds. Uh, download a database and hit one command, and there you go. You can start throwing data into it. Uh, maybe a little bit too easy, but this is a trade-off that's driven adoption of these. You know, I can install Mongo, for instance, locally and start using it in seconds. I can install Couchbase and use it in less than a minute. And so these are the sorts of trade-offs that these vendors are doing to make it easier. So it has to do with getting more users and ultimately getting new customers. And so it appeals to new users because they don't want to spend a lot of time learning something. Otherwise, they're going to stick with what they know. Uh, you know, if you're coming from a relational background, if it's really difficult to get into a NoSQL uh, product, then you might want to just stick with what you, what you know already. For new developers and junior developers, they're brand new to the development scene. There are a lot of them out there, and they're growing every year. If they run into a wall, they're more likely to switch to a different database until they stop hitting a wall regardless of any of the trade-offs, because they're just trying to get up and running. They're trying to understand what's going on. Uh, architects, the more experienced uh, developers, they have the experience, but maybe they're looking to reduce cost or solve a problem that is not a relational uh, database, uh, not a good fit for. So they may start by looking at a handful of different databases out there. And the easier and faster it is for them to evaluate these databases, the more likely it is they'll adopt it. Therefore, it, it makes sense to make these databases very easy to get up and running. And finally, creating prototypes, you know, creating a proof of concept to get potential customer to try on a database as soon as possible. So these are all reasons you want to make your database very, very easy and friction-free to get started. But these kind of trade-offs can be dangerous. And so this is what I think is one of the reasons we saw a lot of the security problems uh, recently. So you've probably seen these in the news before. Uh, you've seen a lot of ransomware attacks. So MongoDB is, is one of them that you see in the news a lot. Because it's the most popular document database, it's also the biggest target. But just a quote from this is that up until recently, the MongoDB default configuration is insecure. And what I mean by insecure is that it basically does not have any authentication. It, you, you get anonymous admin access right out of the box. Um, and so people would do that, and then they would deploy it into production, which is the mistake, uh, exposing to the Internet. And now you get exposed MongoDB instances. Um, that can get uh, compromised fairly easily. Uh, another example is Redis, same sort of thing. Uh, it's an in-memory database, uh, but it's also designed to be uh, used inside trusted environments. Um, so it's, if people are exposing Redis to the internet and they get uh, exposed, and again with the ransomware. Elasticsearch, same sort of thing. People were assuming that AWS was handling some of these security problems, and uh, it wasn't. So, you know, you can deploy to the cloud, you can deploy to some sort of managed service, but you can still have security issues. Uh, Hadoop, also not really a document database sort of thing, but it's the same sort of problem here. There, people were exposing Hadoop to the Internet, uh, which means that they can expose all the data in Hadoop to anyone who knows where the IP address is. And I can keep going, CouchDB, another one, uh, same sort of thing. Same MO as MongoDB and Elasticsearch attacks. So there's insecure by default. Now, I work for Couchbase, which is not CouchDB, and I wish I could say Couchbase uh, did not have this problem. Um, I, fortunately, we didn't really hit the news. Uh, no one was really, uh, at least any way that I'm aware of, no major breaches that were running on Couchbase. But uh, not for lack of trying, I guess. If you look back at an old version of Couchbase, Couchbase 4, which we're currently just about ready to release Couchbase 5.5, but if you look at Couchbase 4, if you go through and go through the default install wizard and install a default bucket and any sample buckets and then deploy this to the, to the internet, those would be out there with no password support. So it's a little bit more work to get Couchbase exposed. It's not completely insecure by default, um, 
But fortunately, a lot of this has changed, which I'm going to talk about later as well. So how does this stuff happen? Aren't we smart people? Don't we know not to expose this stuff to the internet? Uh, well, I talked to Wolfgang Gerlich, who was on my podcast as well. Uh, he's a he's a brilliant guy, has a great a YouTube show, and definitely a guy you should check out on Twitter. And I asked him about this this uh, very question. I didn't actually put this in the podcast. This was not related to what we were talking about. But this was his answer, is because we don't have time, because we're all rushing. Uh, we all follow the same blogs and how-tos on the internet. And rarely do those blogs have security in mind. They usually glance over that, okay, oh yeah, go ahead and, and set up uh, your password to equal password and, and just get on with it, right? So they don't start with the idea that you're going to get attacked. And in addition to this, I also think that there really are some other problems with security that lets this stuff slip through the cracks, right? It's not that the software itself is necessarily broken, it's just that we're not looking at all the ways that someone might try to compromise it. So there's not anyone focused on security on the team. Uh, you know, maybe we think we're a safe, low-priority target. You know, no one's going to actually try to hack us. Um, we don't spend the time and, and or the money to actually train our new and junior developers so that they know what to look for and they know what kind of questions to ask. Or even senior developers, for that matter. I mean, we just get, they get to be senior and they haven't gone through enough training. So I wanted to try this out myself. I wanted to see how easy it was or, or how difficult it was actually to uh, install one of these databases and see if, if it get exposed to the internet and, and if I would get attacked by, by somebody out there. So what I did was I decided to run a, a MongoDB honeypot. And a honeypot is basically uh, something you purposely want a, a bot or a hacker to access in order to learn something about them. Uh, so I didn't actually put any real data in here. It's not production data, but it's just a fake sort of instance that I set up to try to get attention of hackers. So I started by going to MongoDB and trying to run the community edition. So right away, I see in the documentation this warning. Do not make it visible to public networks without running in secure mode with author authorization turned on. So if you're reading the documentation right away, you know uh, you should not be doing this. So that leads me to believe that we're not reading the documentation or we're ignoring parts of the documentation. Now, to set up my honeypot, I actually used an older version of Mongo before they made some recent security tweaks. So they've actually made some changes so that it's no longer insecure by default. And I'll talk about that in a few slides. But I started out by installing this locally, and then I was, uh, you know, I, I tried, I tried to publish it and, and uh, open up the ports and everything. And I was warned by a friend of mine, Bill Semf, who is an info security expert, uh, that it might be risky to expose my home network in this way. So I instead created an Ubuntu uh, virtual machine on Windows or on Microsoft Azure, and I installed Mongo there instead. And I used apt-get to install it on Ubuntu. And I have all the details in the slide notes if you want them. I'll make the slides available to you. But I just took them directly from MongoDB documentation on how to install MongoDB on Ubuntu. So I didn't do anything really crazy there. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, the next thing... I did was once I had that installed, okay, I actually took the IP address and I, I tried to make that available. Um, so when I presented this the first time, I, I put the IP address right here in the slide and I told people that they could install an Android app to actually explore, you know, connect to a Mongo database and gave them the IP address to do so. So I asked them to play along. I also asked them to be kind and not put anything uh, profane in the database or delete everything or at least till the session's over because um, I eventually took the VM down soon after that session. Um, so yeah, you could do this with an Android app. And I, I tried it with Android because I wanted to make sure I was using completely separate network than what the Mongo instance was on. So I thought I'd, I'll use my cell phone, uh, ISP, and that's definitely not on the same network. So I can verify that I'm definitely able to access my database uh, outside of Mongo, or outside of my own uh, installation. So then to set up the honeypot, I decided to create some tempting looking data. I'm not sure it really matters to the bots what the data actually is, but just for fun, I wanted to make my data look really valuable. So I went to the site json-generator.com and I created some data that looks like this. It's got credit card number, social security number, um, birthday, which is enough information right there to steal an identity, I believe, but also name, email, phone, address, all those sorts of things. And it generates this data, sort of random looking data, uh, for me, and I save that into a JSON file called generated.json. 
I, I think there's a thousand records there. And then once I had that JSON file, I ran a utility, a command line utility called Mongo import, and I created a database called come and get it, and the collection in that database is called credit cards. And I can just import from a JSON file there directly with the Mongo import utility. You can do the same thing with the Couchbase command line uh, CB import utility as well. And then I set up inbound outbound security rule on Azure to expose Mongo port 2717 to the internet. Now, at this point you might be thinking, okay, you're just being reckless now. A junior dev wouldn't even know to do that, to expose a port number uh, to, the, to the internet. So what, what I'm saying then is, okay, well, if I install Mongo on Ubuntu, then it's safe by default. It's only exposed to the trusted network on Azure. Okay, that may be the case, but I submit to you that if you look at Azure and you're looking at inbound security rules and you're, and you're just deciding to add those rules, there's a drop-down list here, and MongoDB is one of the options on the drop-down list, as long, uh, along with a bunch of other databases there as well. So, again, we see a trade-off here of ease of use. You can just select Mongo from a drop-down versus security. Uh, and by the way, when I did this at home, I had to set up uh, port forwarding on my router when I was not using Azure. I did a similar thing with port forwarding. And also, one other side note here while I'm talking about this, there's another tweak in the MongoD uh, uh, configuration file that I had to do. So I had to remove uh, a bind IP setting in there. I can show you all the details of that. Uh, this is a setting that MongoDB will only accept connections from localhost. So this is kind of curious because I'm using an old version of Mongo which isn't supposed to be uh, defaulted in that way. The newer versions do. So I think it's either that Mongo retroactively changed older versions, which is kind of good. That's a good step. Uh, or it's possible that developers are always removing this line or using some other mongod.com file. And again, they might be just blindly following blog posts out there that, that show the quickest, easiest way to get done, not taking security into account. So if you want details of that, I've got all those in, in the notes for this presentation as well. And that was it. Once I did that, I connected with my Android app and I could see the data from my Android device, and so just to make sure there's no overlapping weirdness, I did this all from my cell phone uh, network, uh, connecting to an Azure network. Um, so I use Metro PCS, and I'm connecting to an Azure IP address. So I can view this data, I can also edit it, delete it, view all the details, etc. And notice that this Android app is loading six records at a time, so one page in this app is six records. And I also turned on verbose logging for Mongo on the back end, so you probably can't read that on the screen here, but it's actually querying six documents from the collection, which is the, the page in an Android app there. So what I was doing was actually showing up in the log. So it was all making sense. Now, I had trouble actually attracting any sort of bots to my honeypot, actually. I'm not really sure why that is. It was a publicly exposed IP address with the correct port number open. Uh, so it was there for the picking. It was there for the taking. Uh, so I couldn't actually get anybody to, to any bots anyway to do this. But I did uh, ac ask on Twitter for someone to give it a try, and someone actually did. So this is a person that is not me, it's Shannon Code, uh, Shannon Null Code on Twitter. And they went through and logged in successfully and pulled all the data from Mongo and posted it on Twitter. So at least one person successfully accessed it, so at least it proves the concept out that yes, it's pretty easy to make this mistake, to put a database out there and leave it uh, insecure and open to the world. And just to prove the point a little further, it's not just me. There's a, there's a site out there called shodan.io, and I'll give you a link to it at the end. This site scans for open ports and vulnerable hosts of all kinds, not just Mongo, but all kinds. And this happens to be a map from that website, shodan.io, specifically of unsecured Mongo hosts in the United States, in North America. These are MongoDB hosts with no authentication that are open, exposed to the internet. Some of these are probably honeypots, some of these are probably legit, but all you need is an IP address that you can get easily from Shodan.io and you can log into these servers. Now you probably should not do that because they're not your servers, but if you were to do that, you would notice that many of them have ransom notes in them already. So mine never got attacked, maybe I did something wrong or maybe I just got lucky. But what can we do to stop this stuff from happening? And by we, I mean developers now. We'll talk about uh, other, other parties uh, later. But what can we do as developers? Well, the first thing we can do is we can move to North Korea. If 
you look at the shodan.io map, there's not a single exposed MongoDB host there. So that's the safest place in the world to be if you don't want to have any um, database ransom notes. So I say we all move to North Korea. But barring that, there's some other steps we can we can take. And these are some of these are painfully obvious steps to take. The first one is put a password on your database. Even if it's going to be inside a trusted network, uh, just put a good password on there because you never know what some other process on the network might do to allow unauthorized access. So some InfoSec people will say there's no such thing as a trusted network. So it's always a good idea to put a password on there. Uh, and make sure it's a good password, right? So don't just use administrator and password like you see in the blog post. And I'm, I'm guilty of this as well. I do this all the time in my blog posts and videos. I use administrator as the username and password as the password. Those are the e most easily guessed options there. Don't use admin. Don't use SA. Don't use one of the top 100 most common passwords like uh, President Scroob here putting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 on his luggage. Uh, don't use let me in. Just use a good password. Two, we need to think about injection. So assuming we've got the database itself secured on the network, or assuming we have it on uh, some cloud provider, some DBAS service, there's still ways to uh, get around security restrictions in these databases. And one of those ways is injection. So you might be familiar with SQL injection. And this is the famous the comic from XKCD that demonstrates the uh, concept. But uh, you might think, well, we're in NoSQL world, so there's no tables, so therefore I'm safe from injection. I'm safe from SQL injection. And that is definitely not true. So just for one example, here's MongoDB. There's still an injection danger. A lot of it is in the where keyword. If you're using uh, MongoDB's uh, sort of JSON query language, you can put in uh, a where uh, phrase, and that can evaluate JavaScript and it's on by default, at least the last time I checked, this was on by default, allowed by default. Um, this is also a good place to mention that the Cosmos DB, another NoSQL database that Microsoft uh, uh, has released to Azure, also supports the Mongo API. So there could be similar issues there as well. So this isn't just limited to Mongo. But even if you aren't using uh, Mongo or, or Cosmos, this still might actually affect you. Um, I wouldn't make any assumptions. Cosmo may turn it off by default, but I would not make that assumption. I would test to find out. So uh, we can, if we bring in user input, this can be injected. How do we deal with this? So there's, there's really four ways I can think of to, to deal with this sort of problem. So one is you can completely turn off JavaScript evaluation on the server side. This is on by default, and turning it off will limit your capabilities to some extent. But that might be one option to do that, especially if you're not going to use where. The second is just don't use where. And this is actually what the Mongo documentation recommends, at least the last time I read it, is don't use where. There's probably some other way to query this data, uh, some other way to get to it without actually trying to do an eval type thing on the server side. Uh, number three is you can try to sanitize all your user inputs. And I don't think I'd recommend this, this, uh, this way to deal with the, the issue because you have to be right every time in your sanitization and the bad guy only has to be right once to get past your uh, whatever uh, code you have in there to sanitize the input. So I wouldn't recommend that. Maybe in some uh, edge cases it might be useful. And the fourth way is you can actually use uh, another layer on top of this, like an ODM library. Mo Mongo pr provides a mongoose, which is for Node, and there are other similar libraries that abstract this stuff away, so you will be unable to, or at least it will be more difficult to, inject this type of evaluation server side. And if you thought you were safe from SQL injection, well, if you look at Couchbase, we have a uh, query language called Nickel, N1QL, which is just a full ANSI SQL implementation of uh, SQL for JSON. So uh, I find this to be much more natural than Mongo. This is one of the things that appeals to me about Couchbase. Uh, and also, you get things like joins and group by and aggregation and all that cool stuff. And I've been writing SQL most of my career, so I'm, I like Nickel quite a bit. Uh, Cosmos DB, I should mention, also has a limited SQL implementation, not as, as complete as Couchbase's, but they also have SQL there. Uh, so injection is possibly also going to happen there. So here's an example of me in C Sharp. I'm uh, building a SQL query and I'm passing it to the Couchbase SDK. And you can see I'm passing in username and password just by concatenating the strings. So 
right away, if you've written for SQL Server before, you know this is a no-no. Uh, because if the username comes directly from user input, they can inject SQL into that. So what's the solution? Again, pretty straightforward, very similar to, to SQL Server or, and so on, is you have to parameterize those variables. So I've, in Couchbase's case, it's dollar sign username, dollar sign password, and those can be named parameters there uh, with the Couchbase SDK. Uh, so yeah, parameterization, same as before. So that's another way, another thing you gotta look out for. Another thing we can do to help prevent some problems is we can look for PII. And PII, you may not have heard this acronym before, but it stands for Personally Identifiable Information. You're probably going to start hearing it a lot more now. And there's a whole blog post on it there on calspace.com. But for example, if you're storing unencrypted social security numbers uh, for these poor gingerbread people here, it'll, it's a good idea to look at the data to make sure this isn't actually happening. All right, you may not be able to control everyone who has access to your database or what they put in the database, especially when you have a flexible schema, which NoSQL databases provide. Right? So this could also happen in relational databases. You know, uh, typically you'd ask for, okay, I want a, a social security number column, and maybe that would go through some process you have, some DBA process, and they, the DBA would say, no way, we're not storing social security numbers in this in this uh, table. Uh, of course, with NoSQL, you only have to ask for a, that sort of thing from the DBA. You can just go ahead and start storing whatever JSON you want to. Now, you can still do that in a relational database. You can store the wrong stuff in a field. So this is useful to look for PII no matter what database you're using. But it may be more uh, risky when you got NoSQL, when you have a more flexible schema. So, uh, and one of the use cases that NoSQL is great for is data ingestion. You're pulling data from multiple sources and the data uh, structure being ingested could change at any time. And that's kind of why you'd want to use NoSQL, because it can handle those changes and pull the data over. Uh, so maybe on Monday, you're getting data from a, a bank feed. And then on Tuesday, they decide to start adding some PII to that feed. So there's a risk that PII could end up in your database, and you, you didn't even uh, do that on purpose. It just happened to be in your data ingestion layer. So. Uh, look for this data, run some scripts, and there's a blog post there that can actually help you find PII. Just look for specific formats of numbers and, and strings, and it can help you identify possible PII in your database. And then one more thing we can do is a security audit. So I don't speak from a position of authority here because I've never implemented a formal security audit myself. Uh, whenever I've worked on a team, it's always been ad hoc if we had anything like that at all. I suspect that's true of many development team experiences. Um, well, with one exception, currently I work for Couchbase and they have extensive security testing on auditing on every release, but I'm not on those internal engineering teams. I see the documentation, I see the outputs of those, um, but I, I don't actually participate in them, uh, such as the life of a developer advocate. Uh, but, but I would say some things you should try to implement in your security audit is that Security should be owned by everybody on the team. Everyone on the team should be cognizant of secu possible security issues. But if you're going to have a security audit, you should have at least one person who is responsible for it. Maybe on a rotating basis or whatever, but one person who every week or month or whatever does the security audit and identifies possible issues. So they're responsible for it. Uh, automation. Automate as much as you can into your CI CD pipeline. So some of the uh, the PII stuff I mentioned earlier, some code analysis, checking for those troublesome settings like the JavaScript evaluations, local host only. Uh, if you have some of your uh, network configuration uh, in there, uh, check for those sorts of things to make sure that nothing major has changed. And you can do that in an automated way. Uh, automate your log analysis. So look for, look through your logs. The logs can tell you a lot of stuff. You can look for failed attempts at login. Uh, you can consider automatic temporary blacklisting of IP addresses if they're trying to be too abusive and you can also just learn from what they're attacking and, and what they're probing and how they're doing it so look at those log files and you can also automate this as well to give you some notifications like oh there's a there's a, a spike in logs uh, happening maybe you should look into it I mentioned PII earlier you can automate that put that into your CI CD pipeline or, or put it into some other process uh, that checks your your live data now, of course, uh, the problem with checking live data for PII is that you might have some impact on your customers. Uh, so you may want to consider some sort of analytics tool to do that without affecting your, your customers' uh, data access speed. Uh, fuzzing, 
and other sorts of exploits, you can automate these. And again, you probably want to think twice before doing this against production, but maybe you want to do it against production. You can look for things like injection attacks, but also cross-site scripting. And oh, by the way, it can help you find some bugs too. So it's sort of a win-win in, uh, in both situations. And finally, hire someone. If, you, if you're worried about not doing the right thing or you're worried about getting started and you're handling uh, sensitive data, uh, look at a consultant, an expert, a white hat to come in and help you. Because, as I'm going to touch on here in a little bit, uh, the cost of a consultant or an expert is going to be far, far less than the cost of disclosure, reparations, lawyers, credit monitoring, etc. Now, my honeypot never got touched in the two months that I had it uh, up there, so maybe I'm lucky. But imagine presenting to your CEO and saying, our plan is to hope that no one notices us. I don't think it's going to go for that. I also want to just say a quick side note here. I've said a lot of stuff about how NoSQL can be a security liability, but it's not just a liability. I'm sure all security professionals would agree that security would be would not be that hard if it weren't for all the software, or maybe it wouldn't be that hard if it weren't for all the developers. But I, I don't want you to walk away from this thinking that NoSQL is just a liability. So one use case I can think of, consider the migration of one-way hashes. So you're storing... Uh, credentials in your database and if you're doing a good job you're going to be hashing those and, and seeding them and storing them as those one-way hashes. Um, now uh, hashes seem to get broken all the time so if you're using MD5 hash still in your system I got bad news for you it's been uh, broken for a long long time uh, you need to migrate to something else uh, but that's this is true of pretty much all hashes I think they all get broken eventually they all have a shelf life um, you know, SHA, bcrypt, other, any sort of hash you're using has a shelf life and eventually gets broken. So you need to be able to migrate your users from an old hash to a new hash. And this is always going to be a chore. But if you don't have a rigid schema, it's going to be a little easier. So you can just check flexibly, does the document have the new hash field? Well, then we're good. If not, it's time to migrate. We don't have to add any extra columns or modify the schema interpret existing columns, uh, anything like that. So this is one way where using NoSQL can actually benefit you when it comes to security. Anyway, that's just a quick side note. I don't you really think I'm too down on, on NoSQL security. All right, now what can vendors do? What can NoSQL uh, projects, companies, databases, open source uh, groups actually do? And so I say one is just add security features. So databases like Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres, They've got a lead of about 30 to 40 years on, on the current crop of NoSQL databases. And a lot of these NoSQL database companies are you know, fledgling, smallish companies, um, and they're trying to carefully balance features being added and trade-offs of those features. You know, The goal here is not to reinvent a relational database. right? Um, but as far as security goes, I think NoSQL vendors still have a lot of work to do. Now, I'm happy to work with Couchbase and see that Couchbase is taking the lead on some of these things. So you can no longer install Couchbase without setting up a, you can no longer use Couchbase, I should say, without setting up a user, credentials, permissions, role-based security. Uh, so you just can't do that. The trade-off here is that it takes a little longer to get Couchbase uh, started, up and running and started, um, but I think that's just a small price to pay. Uh, so we're taking the lead on that. Another option you can do, as I've mentioned this already, is managed hosting. So this can help shift the security concerns over to someone else's computer. This doesn't mean it's always going to be more secure. So we saw the Elasticsearch example where they assumed AWS was handling the security. And that's not the case. right? You can still use Cosmos, you can still use MongoDB Atlas in an insecure way. But you don't have to worry as much about upgrades and patches and things like that. Uh, and my company, Couchbase, is also working on uh, figuring out our place in a, a truly managed, uh, hosted DBAS uh, market there. We're working on that. And then I would suggest, just in general, we start shifting the pendulum from fast and easy by default over to the safe by default. And, and I, I drew this umpire. I guess umpires kind of used to look like this, right? Not so much anymore. Uh, so require passwords. You know we're seeing little of that. Couchbase does not have any passwordless options anymore. Uh, require strong passwords. So we're not there yet. I can still use a lousy password uh, in Couchbase in a lot of these systems. Uh, even in SQL Server, I think I can still use a lousy password. 
this is probably the toughest thing to shift to a safe by default mindset because the database market is really competitive and every vendor wants to rope in a new user as quickly as possible. Now, I'm just one person on a small team. Uh, my input means something, but it means even more when a potential customer, potential user sends me an email and says, I won't use Couchbase because of this security reason. That's a tangible thing I can pass along to PMs and I can say, hey, people are not using us because of this feature. So it's a critical thing. We need to prioritize this. So that's something you can help me do. Uh, pass this feedback along to, um, to our uh, product managers and to our decision makers. And the same thing with other, other vendors as well. Uh, they all have people who are out there listening, listening to you. Pass this feedback along to them and, and tell them. Uh, do it in a nice way, but, but tell them that, uh, hey, hey I, I'm not comfortable with this until this security feature is, is here. All right, and what can we do as an industry, uh, as the whole developer technology industry? And this is where I get a little bit preachy, uh, but I'm going to bring it back around to security, I promise. So I hear chatter and I see a lot of news about shortages of developers or shortage of good developers uh, or shortage of affordable developers sometimes I think is what we're seeing between the lines. So, But lately it seems like everyone is always hiring. But what I haven't seen is a lot of companies willing to mentor, apprentice, and train new developers. So there may be some lip service in some places, some token mentor training program um, something without any teeth because doing that costs a lot of money it costs a lot of time and everyone is really too busy uh, so I think about this cartoon a lot um, there's a lot of hiring but there's not really any training and mentoring so you expected to come in a new hire come in on day one and maybe not be productive but expected to be billing hours on day one right so this new developer in a rush no time to learn because learning is not billable they lean on Stack Overflow, they lean on Google results, they lean on blog posts, and they figure out for themselves something that works. And as we touched on before, those blog posts, those Stack Overflow answers, they don't necessarily include security uh, in every single aspect of the answers. So um, my suggestion, my call to action for the industry as a whole is to give your training some teeth. Uh, give your mentoring some teeth. Don't just say to employees, you have a budget of X dollars, you know, what conference do you want to go to? All right, so develop a mentoring program and emphasize billable hours less. I know that may sound a little bit painful, uh, but if you're truly investing in the long term, then you can't expect results right away. Uh, so this is not only going to improve the quality of your people, but it's going to give you the ability to hire people with little, no little to no experience and train them up. And so you might have this thought in your mind, what happens if we train them and they leave? Well, the opposite question to respond to that is, what happens if we don't train them and they end up staying? I don't know the source of that quote. Um, uh, Richard Branson is often quoted something like that. So I want to just put up a slide here, and I swear Kevin didn't put, put me up to this. I know he does a lot of training at SwiftKick, but uh, this was in my slides long before I agreed to do uh, the SwiftKick um, show. Uh, but the, I just wanted to show some examples of the cost of insecurity. So Equifax, it's a famous breach that happened last year. I don't, don't think any of these are related to NoSQL, but they are certainly um, security breaches. Uh, when I read this article in 2017, it said $87.5 million is what the Equifax cost is. And that's just the nominal cost of it. It does not even include things like the, the damage to the brand, right? So if you... Uh, wanted to, if you, if one of your customers was Equifax, for instance, and you really wanted to showcase, and you're really proud of that, they were your customer. Well, this breach happens, and now Equifax is the name is smeared. Maybe it's no fault of yours, but now you can't, you know, you can't be proud of that anymore. You can't brag about that anymore. Um, and if you're in a competitive business and your brand name is smeared, then that's going to just help your competitors. And so, how do you measure those actual costs? Same thing with Target, that's an older breach. Uh, people may have just stopped shopping at Target completely because of that breach. So how do you measure the cost of that? And Volkswagen, not really a security thing, I guess, kind of is, but that $18 billion for that uh, scandal there. And I wanted to show this uh, chart here. So just in general, uh, the cost per capita of a data breach over the past 12 years. I'm not sure if this is in dollars or thousands of dollars or, or I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars or what, but 
it shows that it costs money when there's a data breach. And just a little bit of training can prevent even a part of these. It's going to be worth it for sure. So training is what I'm saying. Uh, so I want to sum up. They say that you only remember about three or four things after you sit through a presentation like this. So these are the things I want you to remember. No SQL. It's a buzzword. I have a love-hate relationship with it. Try not to use it. Use one of these other ones instead. Be more specific. Well, when you say no SQL, you're talking to somebody else. They may be thinking of Hadoop, and you're thinking of Cassandra. So get on the same page. Use the term document. Use the term graph, etc. Security, as always, be on guard. Vigilance as a team is the price of security, especially with newer software like NoSQL. You'll take the time to make sure you know what's exposed, why it's exposed, and how it's protected. Make security part of your process, so add security audits, put someone in charge of it, and automate it as much as you can. And don't make assumptions about security. Don't assume that AWS or Azure or Mongo Atlas is going to handle it for you. Don't assume there are no injection vectors. Finally, I want you to go check your NoSQL right now. So if anybody is using NoSQL tools that I mentioned, go make sure they are secure, that they're behind a firewall, they have a password, they're up to date, especially if it's one I mentioned today. So here's some resources for you to check out. Shodan.io, it's a device search engine. They search for all those open ports and make those cool maps. Um, NoSQL Map is a tool on GitHub. It's a, a tool to automatically audit and inject attacks against NoSQL databases. I think it currently only supports Mongo, but it may get CouchDB, Redis, Cassandra support in the future. So this is a tool that you can use to see if you're vulnerable. And I would submit a Couchbase pull request, but I don't know any Python, so um, maybe someday. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about NoSQL, check out martinfowler.com slash nosql.html. He has done a lot of writing and evangelism on NoSQL over the years. Some of his material is a bit out of date, but for the most part, it's very relevant. I also mentioned Wolfgang Gerlich a couple of times. Definitely check out his his blog and his uh, video blog uh, on uh, jwgerlich.com slash blog on all things InfoSec. Uh, one more quick plug for Couchbase. So all I ask is you give Couchbase a chance. It's a free download. You can try out the Enterprise Edition indefinitely for free. Uh, there's a community edition you can even put into production if you if you want to use that for a smaller project. You can try it out on, on any of the major cloud providers for free as well. Um, so just give it a shot. And then just for you SwiftKick fans, uh, I've got a uh, survey here. So if you go to tinyurl.com slash kick2018, this is something new that I'm doing this year to try to get feedback as I present sessions different places. Um, it's a it's a survey. It's literally a one-question survey. It takes you almost no time to fill out. It helps me out a lot. And make sure to use the code KICK2018, and you'll be entered to win a $100 gift card. So go ahead and do that. You can find more information about me and Couchbase. Go to blog.couchbase.com. I do a lot of writing there, as well as my teammates. I do a lot of writing about Couchbase and NoSQL. I'm on Twitter at mgroves. If you have questions about this session, please feel free to contact me. Uh, this is my gorgeous family. My enormous head barely fits in the picture. So, uh, I see we're about the 46 minute mark. So normally I'd go for some Q&A, but I have anticipated some of your cues and prepared some A's. Because these are the uh, questions I get asked all the time. So I've, I've decided to go ahead and make slides for them. So we'll start with one. Uh, Couchbase and Mongo, how are they different? I get this question all the time. And so I like to compare the architecture first and then the features second. The architecture is something that cannot easily be changed about either one of these things. And so a Couchbase has a memory first architecture. So everything you do goes into memory first and then it gets written to disk asynchronously, which is very good for performance um, and very good for replicating and, and uh, very quick operations. It has a master-master architecture. So when you scale out Couchbase, every single node in that cluster can do reads and writes. Um, whereas Mongo, you typically might have a master-slave set up in place where you have one node handling the writes and other nodes are just read-only, uh, which, is, which is fine, but it doesn't scale quite as efficiently. And then auto-sharding. So with Couchbase, you don't have to think about sharding at all. It automatically happens. Uh, the, the, the data is split up evenly between all the nodes. With Mongo, you typically have to set up some sort of sharding scheme, uh, and that's just extra work for you to do that. 
Uh, in Couchbase, we call them V-buckets, and it's done by uh, CRC32 algorithm, but you don't have to know this stuff as a developer. And then features is another thing. So features can change, uh, things come and go, uh, but I still like to compare the differences. Couchbase has the full SQL query language we call Nickel. Uh, Mongo has a query language too, but it's a, a little more limited and it's not SQL-like. Um, Couchbase is a full text search built in. It uses the Believe search engine. It's uh, language aware, full text search capabilities, kind of like Lucene or Elasticsearch sort of thing, but it's built right into Couchbase. And Couchbase has a great mobile story uh, and synchronization. So uh, we have an uh, offline first database called Couchbase Lite, and it can sync with Couchbase in your data center using a sync gateway. And so that does that automatically. Again, you don't have to write all that syncing code, it happens. Um, happens on its own. Now one thing I'll give Mongo is that they do have a uh, DBAS cloud provider called MongoDB Atlas. There's a couple other competing ones as well like MLabs I think is also offering Mongo as a service. That'll take me to question five here. Is there a Couchbase cl managed cloud service? And right now the short answer is no there's not. Uh, the longer answer is we kind of have one. We've partnered with Zdata and they provide uh, Couchbase managed services. Um, so you can, you can go through them if you want to. And the longest answer is, well, I, I want you to come and talk to me about that. And what, what do you see as being interesting to you about a DBAS uh, solution, a database as a service solution? Uh, we do have, uh, we're in the Azure and AWS and Google Cloud marketplaces, and there are some wizards to make the config easy, but it still runs on your VMs. So I'm curious to know what appeals to you most about a DBAS and, uh, you know, help us to build that out because we're definitely in the process of, uh, figuring out what we want to do for our DBAS offering. So uh, come talk to me, uh, tweet me, send me an email. Is Couchbase the same thing as CouchDB? I get this asked all the time. Uh, the short answer is no, it's not the same thing. But here's a little bit of a longer answer. So there's an open source project called CouchDB. There's an open source project called MemcacheD. These both still exist as open source projects. Uh, early on, these had some companies spawn around them uh, called CouchOne that provides support and integration and stuff for CouchDB. And the same thing for Memcached called Membase. And these two companies existed, and they looked at each other and they said, hey, why don't we get our chocolate and peanut butter together and create a disk-based document database like CouchDB with a memory-first architecture like Memcached up front. So we have the best of both worlds together. So these companies merged. It took the couch from Couch1 and the base from Membase, and they formed a new company called Couchbase, creating a new product called Couchbase Server which exists independently of CouchDB and Memcached. So all three of these things exist together. Uh, they all are considered NoSQL, but I, I think Couchbase is the best of both worlds and had added a lot of features to it since those early days of, of CouchDB and Memcached. Finally, Couchbase licensing situation. Uh, we have a fully open source community edition called Couchbase Server Community. It's Apache 2 licensed. The binary release is, is one release behind Enterprise, except for major reversions. You can use this wherever you want to. Production, uh, tev, test, dev, QA, wherever you want to. You only get f community support, only forum support, though. If you want to use, uh, if you want more complete support, you can get paid support through Couchbase Server Enterprise. It is a mostly open source uh, release there. Uh, everything's Apache 2. There's some features that I think are closed source, especially in, in version 5 or later. And there are a lot of features there that are not available on a community, but these are typically features that you'd want uh, or you need in an enterprise, right? So uh, rack zone awareness and multi-dimensional scaling and things like that. So if you think you might want to use this in your enterprise, download the enterprise edition. It's free for you to try out on dev, test, or QA. Uh, and then you just need a commercial license to go into production for that. Okay. And question number three, you can't really tell because I'm, I'm sitting down and I'm on a webcam here, but I, I'm a, a tall guy, so I get asked all the time, how tall are you? Do you play basketball? Six foot six, no, I'm way too clumsy for basketball. So I want to again apologize for the technical difficulties with the Swift Kick Show. Uh, I hope this uh, does a small part to make up for it. Um, I appreciate uh, Kevin Griffin having me on the show. Uh, Kevin's a great guy, and he could pick uh, pretty much anybody to be on the show, but I really appreciate him uh, bringing me on. And so if you want to contact me, again, just uh, mgroves on Twitter. Um, you can, that's usually the best place to get a hold of me. Or you can email me, me at mgroves.com. 
And I'd be happy to answer any questions or any sort of discussions or take any sort of comments or feedback you have. So thanks very much for watching. You guys have a good day.